Good morning, everyone. My name is Margaret Mueller. I'm the president and CEO of the Executives Club of Chicago. Thank you all for joining us this morning for Beyond Cloud, Reimagining Experiences of the Future. We have a lot of people joining us this morning. I see the numbers going up. We're gonna give everyone a moment or two to settle into the session. So while we wait, please enjoy a word from our tech and innovation series sponsor, Accenture. With a bang, energy and change came to every part of our universe. Seismic or small, it continues. Change is all around us. Shaped by technology and human ingenuity, we can make it work for you and your business. Many thanks to Accenture for your support of the technology and innovation series this season. You've been great friends of the club. We're so grateful for your partnership and championing today's program. So a quick housekeeping note about GoToWebinar for those who maybe haven't joined with this program before. If you hover your mouse on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a quotation bubble icon, and there you can ask our speakers any questions you might have. I know we have a packed conversation this morning. Brad will do his best to get to as many audience questions as possible later on in the program. And additionally, you'll see a paper icon on the screen, which opens up today's program, which includes the agenda and details about upcoming programs at the club. And lastly, before we get started, uh, a plug for our brand new podcast. It's called The Executives Exchange. It features Chicago CEOs and founders. Please take a moment to take out your phone right now, if you can, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. It's on uh, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. And then once you subscribe, you can enter a raffle to win a free pair of wireless noise canceling headphones, compliments of our podcast sponsor, sure. So on to today. As many of our businesses and lives seem to be migrating further and further into digital engagement, Understanding cloud storage is vital to both our professional and personal lives. I was just talking to someone about this the other day, when I think about the number of photos just I personally have on like Google Drive and Google Photos, and I'm not even that active on social media, and then I start multiplying that out in my mind, my head starts to hurt. And that doesn't even include, you know, the billions of people and millions of businesses that are using, you know, large amounts of cloud. So I'm really excited about today's conversation. So to introduce today's program and to provide us a bit of framework on the importance of cloud as a driver of new opportunity, I want to welcome Manish Anand, the Midwest Cloud Leader for Accenture. Over to you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you, Margaret, for the introduction and the opportunity to be here today. I'm Manish Anand. I work with our clients to help them achieve their business objectives by leveraging leading edge technologies such as cloud. And I also, as, as Margaret said, lead our cloud practice here. I'm honored to be here with you to kick off our exciting conversation about the importance of experiences and how cloud technology can help companies reimagine experiences for the future. To explore this topic, we have a panel of business leaders with us this morning. We'll introduce our panel just in a few minutes. First, I'd like to start by asking everyone to think about some of the ways your life has changed over the last 12 months. Just simple things like grocery shopping or shopping. From my own personal experiences, I used to travel four to five days a week, and now I'm in, I've been in my home office for the last 15 months. And this has been a significant change for me and, and for our personal lives. And this is consistent with what we're also seeing from our research. 95% of people have made at least one change to their lifestyle that they expect to be permanent. That's a really big number. Our research has shown that 95% of people are making a permanent behavior change. These changes are having a big impact on business. Our research showed these transformed consumers now say that they're choosing products and services based on values and experience rather than price and quality. Think about that for a second. They value things like health and safety, convenience, social impact, sustainability, customer service, and the origin of the product or service. Companies are looking to pivot from recovery back to growth. And many are realizing that growth formula must adapt to meet these new needs of consumers. And companies, hopefully yours, and maybe your competitors are responding with unique and innovative offerings. As everything we experience is up for reimagine, this 
presents a massive opportunity for those who don't just observe the shift in expectations, but shape shift their organization and products to create new mutual value with their customers and employees through meaningful, authentic experiences. Business leaders recognize this. In fact, in our research, we found almost 80% of CEOs say they feel the need to deeply reimagine how they engage with and treat their customers, consumers, and employees. As consumers, as employees, that feels right and is encouraging. So what does this mean for companies? We've identified a route that focuses on experience, which requires companies to push beyond what we think as traditional customer experience or CX. We're talking about an evolution of what we call a business of experience or BX, where experience and customer obsession is not just a workshop, a work stream, or about optimizing a touch point, but a unifying way of working across the organization. Leading companies have compressed a decade of digital transformation into one or two years. Think about that for a second. 10 years of transformation in less than 24 months. That's just incredible. To move that fast requires vision, focus, and speed. It's not easy, but it's possible. Today, we're gonna to focus on just one aspect of digital transformation, cloud technology which can be the catalyst for your company to fully embrace and activate the business of experience. Hence, to deep dive on cloud and the business of experience, our discussion today will focus on two core themes. Our first theme is that experience are continuously evolving and evolving faster than ever before. Take the grocery store, for example. A few years ago, grocery shopping started to change. We started to see digital uh, coupons, self-checkout lines, and other small changes, but now, the grocery experience can be completely different if you want it to be. There are a few options for you, home delivery, curbside mm -hmm. pickup, automatic auto refills. Something as simple as getting groceries has become a totally new experience. You have more options now and can choose the experience that best meets your needs. The second theme for our panel today is that cloud technology can be an important driver of these new experiences for your customers and employees. And one of the benefits, as a number of you know, of cloud is that it can power a deeper level of data and analytics for your company. And with data and analytics, you can do amazing things. For example, segment your customers with more precision or manage your inventory with better accuracy or create unique omni-channel customer experiences. What you're gonna to hear today is that experience is now a fundamental element of business. Companies delivering great experiences will likely see revenue growth and better employee retention. We have three phenomenal companies here this morning, CNA Insurance, Mondelez, and Accenture. You're gonna hear about how they have embraced cloud as a driver of experience and how they create new opportunities and overcome these challenges. I know you're excited to hear from our panelists. Hence, I'm gonna to introduce today our moderator, Brad Henderson. Brad is the founding CEO of P33. He leads the nonprofit while encouraging global technology leadership for Chicago, and inclusive economic growth for all. Brad has over two decades of professional experience and a deep under understanding of how to unlock economic opportunities that benefit business and individuals. Brad, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much for that in incredible overview. Uh, and I, I just couldn't be more excited about the conversation today. This is such an important technology, uh, it's such a critical moment. If I think about a technology that sits at this intersection, the ability to unlock so much speed and agility and new ways of, of doing things. And yet it's still so hard to go from the old to the new and all the changes we've experienced in a world that basically became all virtual. And now we're trying to sort out, well, where are we going next? What does it mean to reopen and, and, and what is that going to entail? And to get that conversation to start it and to build on um, uh, some of the opening remarks, uh, I'd ask each of the panelists to do two things. Um, first is just introduce yourself, and I'll start with Jane. And the second, uh, as you introduce yourself, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, uh, there is this transition we've gone through the past 14, 15 months or so. Um, what's the biggest change that you've experienced that, that really uh, is forcing you to, uh, to rethink the future uh, and what's gonna be required? So I'll start with Jane. Thanks, Brad. Uh, good morning. My name is Jane Passell. I'm the Chief Information Officer at CNA Insurance. Uh, it's an interesting question, right? Because 
I think, you know, when you think about the consumer experiences, that's an easier way for me to get my brain around all the things that's changed. Because I can look at my own world and say, oh, I, yes, groceries, right? I, I ordered Peapod occasionally before. Um, obviously, in Chicago, we don't have that option anymore. But I, you know, I, I had to figure out a new way of doing it. And I'm not sure I'm going to go back. Now, we at CNA Insurance, we don't sell to end consumers. So we don't sell personal lines. We're a commercial lines insurance carrier, which means our customers are businesses. Um, and I would say the biggest change I've seen is there are interactions that, you know, we've declared for years in our business. They can't possibly be virtual, right? Risk management services. We have to go and we have to look at the building and we have to talk to people and we have to look at processes. There's no way that could possibly ever be virtual until there was literally no other choice but to execute it in a virtual manner. So I, I think that's the biggest change I've seen is, is things that were an absolutely never have come back onto the table um, in interesting ways and, and forcing us to think differently. Great. Thank you. And Javier? Hey, Brad. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for those joining us. So Javier Polita, I'm the Chief Information and Integrated uh, Shared Services Officer for Mondelez uh, International. Uh, you know, I, I think about your question, Brad, and you think about the, the short 14 to 15 months, and we've seen a lot of metrics change, some that Manish has shared, and just think about digital transactions have increased over 3,500% globally. And that we take to our per new personal and professional lives that we're living in our home offices, and which is now a, a home, a gym, our office, and everything else, which is adding complication. But I think what's really changed is, in every sense of the word, there's new daily digital regiments. And the times of those digital daily regiments has changed. We thought that we understood consumer behaviors to be relevant and contextual in the past. And those behaviors have changed. You know, if you think around the world, the consumer possibly in Japan that would take the train to go to work and then and then walk the rest of the way to work. There was times of days when you would try to connect with that consumer. When they're walking back home, they buy in their digital formats and the digital uh, vending machines products to take home and consume and that's the right time to contact them and today all that's changed because there's no longer a train ride to work work is at home right so trying to understand all of that again it is complicated because you want to make certain that when you when you serve a consumer it's at the right time and uh, and it's contextual so all those digital regiments are new now and i think when we talk about cloud and the conversations today you also have to bring data into the picture i think data is going to go has grown at an even a greater exponential rate and all the data that's been created in the past 10 years that's been created and curated will happen again in in, in a year's time so we have to think about that as well okay thank you and beijo oh uh, yeah sure thanks brad uh so again my name is beijo i look after the corporate strategy but also our strategy and design teams for accenture interactive which is a, a business unit of accenture really focused on driving new customer growth and, and helping businesses kind of reimagine themselves through the lens of experience. So to, to answer your question around the biggest change and the consequence, I, I, I kind of agree with the rest of the panelists. You don't, you don't actually have to look far. Uh, Manish Jane and Javier kind of referenced it, which is start with yourself. Uh, it's very clear all of us have changed in, in some small ways, but also some large ways. And I was just thinking about some research we did. Uh, it hasn't dropped yet, so you, you're hearing about first here, but uh, over the, over the last year, we found that over 50% of consumers globally, over 50% have said they completely revised their personal purpose and what's important in their lives. Uh, it's, it's, it's not surprising, hopefully that resonates uh, because you've had a lot of time to reflect over the last year. But as part of that, we've all been willing, perhaps forced to try new things, new experiences, new brands, new technologies, new employers, new ways of working, as Jane said, in, in my neighborhood, uh, there was a Peloton boom. There was also a puppy boom. Uh, so people are trying new things and, and some of the things will be structural and stick and some, some won't. But the key consequence for me is because there's all these behavioral shifts, because everyone is willing to try new things, it's very clear that incumbent brands with incumbent approaches, they just simply don't have the, the incumbent advantage that they once did and we're finding and we're exploring pace setter brands who are creating amazing experiences and, and they kind of leave the rest of the experiences that we, we work with stale, uh, uninspiring. And, and like for me, Peloton what was, a, was a pace setter brand. Every, everything from the way we purchased it to the way we use it, to the way it was installed, to the social element. 
and, and that's a that's a brand that we as a family we compare all of our experiences uh, against at work or, or you know from a consumer perspective. So, Brad, I guess the, when, when we think about future relevance, when we think about future relevance, and Javier used the word relevance, and I like that a lot. The, the big push, the big consequence is not to just incrementally improve, but we, we really focus on wholesale reimagination, really thinking about experiences in a new way, because we all have new needs, new values, and new expectations. Very compelling. It resonates a lot. And I the, the puppy boom, I, it makes me smile. We uh, went on the cat search boom during the same time. It was all digital and involved five states. Something tells me that would have not happened for my 10-year-old daughter two years ago. Um, so, so much has changed. And, and so, Jane, I, uh, the next question, I, I just, um, there's, there's digital uh, and enabling all these new experiences. And then there's its relation to the cloud uh, and what specific role the cloud plays. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about uh, how does cloud enable and fit into um, customer experiences? And if you're not choosing to enable, um, are you limiting what you can do uh, as an insurer, as an example? No, it's, I mean, it is a good question, right? Because it drove me nuts the first number of years that cloud was a thing because cloud was about the cloud, right? Which is anytime that happens with a technology, right? When the internet was about the internet, yes. it's, uh, it, it's sort of missing the point, right? So it's, this is a really key one. And we've talked about it a couple of times. Almost everyone has used the word speed, right? I mean, relevance is uh, contextual for, for what, and I don't care whether you're a small business or a large business or you're a consumer, it's contextual. In other words, it's going to change. Now we've seen dramatic changes and therefore the pace of change, I think, continues to pick up. Again, nothing, nothing surprising. So, so what, right? Cloud really is about speed. I mean, the, the time to provision hardware it, uh, you know, people optimized it for years. And even in the in the best, fastest businesses, I mean, unless you were truly in the hardware business and you could produce it and, you know, buy it in advance, it, it was just, there was a set duration, right? At some point you couldn't make it go any faster. Now you can spin up massive amounts of compute processing, data storage, whatever it is, and you can do it in minutes. Um, and more importantly, and more interestingly, you can do it on demand. Right. Yeah. So you can get to a place where you say, you know what, I really want to try evolving this aspect of the experience. Now, whether that's, you know, now broker relationships for us, those are our distribution partners. Those are digital where they're much more digital than they were before. Everything from do you have the video bandwidth through a SaaS solution to be able to accommodate the fact that all of a sudden people are now using video significantly more than they did before. Everything from something as simple as that in collaboration to actually you know being able to create new solutions and test them in the market quickly spin something up use it spin it down look and see what it is evolve it right so the number one for me really is speed and i think the the expectations and this consumer and ex the, the business of experience is really a good um it's a great use case for you know why cloud i think the other one i would think about too are um you know, you, will your business get left behind? I mean, candidly, I think so at some stage of the game. You know, I, back when the internet was new, no one was sure what it was going to be. Now, I don't think there's a company on the planet that that doesn't think immediately about what your digital presence online is going to look like in some way, shape, or form. That's where the cloud will be. It's just a function of how fast and in what contexts and when. And honestly, I think for the majority of businesses, we're, we're really there at this point. Great. Very insightful. And, and Javier, you know, there, there's in a B2B and a B2C setting, cloud is very applicable, but there are some very unique aspects to each. Uh, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about on the B2C side, um, what this has meant for the consumer experience at, at, um, at, at Mondelez, what it's enabled from an emerging technology perspective. Just talk a little bit more about the specifics of the Mondelez consumer centric journey. Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, Jane said it well, and I think it's about speed and certainly brings life to life to the word agility, right? Because if you build these models correctly, the business environment could basically stand up their own environments and manage their own environments in basically real time. And then, you know, you, you push that into a production environment. But I think when you think about those dimensions, Brad, you need to be very strategic in regards to 
who your global partners are going to be. You know, we operate around the world. So in China, we use Ali Cloud because it's just the strategic platform of choice there. And in, in the rest of the world, we have a three cloud strategy with Azure and we use Google Cloud and we use Amazon. And we're very intentional in regards to what workloads and what platforms go to to these um, different partners. You know, we have our own internal personal belief and experiences of which ones perform better, uh, which ones have better AI capabilities, and that's just a personal choice, right? Complications and stacks, and we could go on and on if we want to, um, but that's some research that everybody should definitely do before they start thinking about a multi-cloud strategy and which is the right partner. But to the, in that cloud strategy also, you need to have a design strategy, right? And we've been very, very clear about having regional data repositories that are relevant to those consumers and to that business. So we believe in, in having capabilities at the edges of the business and empowering the business leaders to, to have those data repositories that are gonna service our consumers in different platforms, right? In regards to making certain that there's a moment of truth where they could basically fulfill their need of one of our phenomenal products, if I could say that. I think everybody should have an Oreo a day. I gotta plug Oreo at least here, but, uh, but anyway, I think, I think those, those uh, regional data strategies are very, very important. But as we think about cloud, it's it's not one thing we have to remind ourselves is not no go, just go stand the environment. Educate the business colleagues at the edges of the business to have hands on keyboard to understand how to go into these repositories to create value for the enterprise also, but more importantly, with the consumer at the front of that. And then you get complicated with all the direct to consumer platforms that you have to build on, on, in different geographies and your e-commerce sites that you have to build in. All that, that, I think the clouds enables some really good resiliency as well, right? Uh, in regards to availability and being uh, able to monetize and serve the customer as well and the consumer. Very helpful. In, in Beijing, um, just if a, a question for you, because you see so many different companies in your role uh, and clearly everyone's going on this journey. Uh, I, I haven't met a company that says we're not interested in, in the cloud or improving our customer experience, but that doesn't mean everyone's leading. Uh, that's pushing the edge that's that's taking bold action i wonder if you can just talk about you know in your experience um what are some of the bolder choices that your company's seen what what's the cutting edge look like in this space if you want to be a true leader um what are some of the trends you're observing or the moves that those folks are making yeah it's, it's a good one brent so javier and jane they, they they both talked about relevance the quest for relevance but also the pace of change in, in my own belief is while tech changes fast, and we've all talked about how customer ex expectations are changing fast, fundamentally organizations don't change fast. And fundamentally people within those organizations do not actually change fast. And so the, the real challenge is often knowing how, how to use the technology effectively and, and responsibly and understand which long-term solutions to go after that would be good fits for humans. And so Brad, when we think about bold, bold choices, it's not just where to play, what, what new channel to go after, where to invest now. The, the boldest choices I'm actually seeing is the how. It's thinking about new ways to modernize the ways of working so you can operate at a pace of change and adapt as you go. And that requires new muscles, new mindsets, new lenses. And, and just one example I was thinking about while, while the other two were talking is, uh, it's actually a client we're working with, uh, it's called Best Buy, you may have heard of it. Uh, they, they, as you can imagine, um, are in, in a continuous search for relevance and agility, as, as Javier said, and they needed to move from functional silos and I would say optimizing individual experiences, really thinking about how to overhaul their entire system, their structure and their operations with the focus of, of putting the entire business in service of their experience, okay, in service of the experience, because that's what's going to drive their relevance. So we actually helped we help them stand up a whole new role, uh, chief customer and marketing officer. And, and uh, Allison Peterson uh, is a good friend of mine. She fills that role. But in addition to the role, we set up a new function and it was a new customer office. And I actually thought this was a bold choice. It's a new function that bring, brings together customer strategy, enterprise strategy, analytics, design, customer experience, employee experience, marketing. And, and crucially, that team has a, a band of ambassadors who sit with the different business areas to bring real customer and human insights, and they advocate for the customer. They advocate for the employees in, in all decisions. And, and you know, the basic things that you'd expect, we would hope they would be asking is, is, is this the right business decision or is this the right business decision and is it good for the customer and is it good for the employees? 
So I, I just thought that was a very bold way of working. It's a new way of working, but it in, introduces a, a pace that they can operate in and they're able to understand and track changes to customer expectations and then bring them quickly to the rest of the business. And, and a lot of this is just, it's, it's kind of infusing or infecting the entire organization with, with that, that crucial word of empathy. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's bringing them a, a way to kind of democratize empathy across the organization. And, and look, I, I, I'm sure Javier and Jane would agree, these things aren't easy, right? The, these shape shifts are hard, uh, but I actually believe that the last year has given all organizations, and, and including ours, the opportunity to actually reimagine how to operate pretty boldly and, and without a, actually a permission slip. I, I, you know, I've been in business a while, I'm sure the other two have as well. I actually think this is one of those opportunities that you consider as a, it's like a once in a generation opportunity to make changes. Very well said. I, I wonder if I can pick up on one theme, a uh, really, really interesting example in Best Buy. And part of what you described is a need to overcome some organizational barriers to, 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 to enable and take advantage of these technologies. Uh, this is for everybody. Are there any other of those obstacles or challenges or um, difficult parts of the cloud journey and the customer experience journey that that um, our audience should be aware of that you think are you know, really the critical ones to overcome, uh, and, and maybe a little bit about how your organizations are thinking about overcoming them? Because as, as Beju said, um, this isn't easy. It doesn't happen overnight. So what are some of those uh, obstacles that could really get in the way if you don't get ahead of them? Maybe I'll start. I mean, there's there's kind of two things. Um, one is specific to that agility that that's been mentioned now multiple times, and the other um, is one of the dirty little secrets around expense and cost as you move through the journey that people don't really talk much about. And until you live it and hit it, <laughs> it can be one of those things that you really don't know is coming, um, and therefore you're not really preparing the organization. So I'll talk about them separately. On the agility one, you know, I, I can talk forever about this. This is something that I'm really passionate about, and we're on a, a journey to operate differently inside of CNA. We've made a lot of progress on it, you know, before I joined and since I've been here in the last year and a half. Um, I, I think that one of the big misses people have in, in agile is it's not about uh, the process. It's not about the principles and the practices, although if you don't get those right, um, it doesn't work. To me, it's about the, the executives in the company saying, I want that business agility, which means I have to make decisions about how I invest and spend my money differently. So it's not about, well, the business decided that they wanna make X, Y, Z changes to these websites. It's about, you know what, I need to grow and how much do I wanna invest in growth in this particular spot? And then how do I set up you know, objective measures to understand how am I gonna know if I'm making progress? And then defining and setting up, you know, specific focused teams whose job is those outcomes. And that's it. Because without that, that leadership construct over the top, then Agile is interesting. But if you're constantly putting handcuffs on of, well, you have to build this, then all of those, you know, contextualized experiences that we talked about, right, that, that relevance, it'll just keep passing you by while teams are busy building the thing that was relevant, you know, a month ago. So I think that's one of them. The other one is really more on the expense side of the world. Um, you know, uh, you, there's this thing that I've lovingly referred to as the cloud bubble. I think a lot of people have experienced it, but until you get to a certain point in the journey, you don't really know what that's gonna look like. And it, it's very simple. As you move things into the cloud, you pay a bill in real time for what you use. It's fantastic. But until you get enough of your infrastructure on-prem or in somebody's data center somewhere, shut down to eliminate the on-prem costs, you get to a place where you're paying for both. Mm -hmm. And instead of this promise of, oh, the cloud is gonna be so much cheaper, you actually hit a point where your infrastructure expense, where your hosting expense goes way up for a period of time. So it's one of the things to be aware of. It's, it happens, but there's things that you can do to manage your way through it. And a lot of that's just simply understanding it's gonna come and planning accordingly. Great, I love, yeah. I love the phrase the cloud bubble. That's uh, mm -hmm. what I'm gonna take away take away from this. Cause it is, it's it's easy to forget you're living in both worlds still uh, and, and what that costs. Mm -hmm. uh, any, anything to add Javier or yeah. Beju? Yeah, maybe just a couple things and turn over to Beju. I think, you know, 
James Wright on the cloud bubble, you know, it could be certainly a runaway cost if you don't start building some controls initially in place. And, you know, now there's reporting ways that you can report to the business how much they're building and how much they're spending, right? Because um, it, it could be that you're both environments for a long time. So I call it cloud now and I keep pushing cloud now. It's about now. It's not about, oh, in three years, we'll migrate this, these workloads over, right? So I think that's very important to, to think about cloud now and just continue to push your team and, and the enterprise in regards to moving uh, data data over. The other big challenge, I think, in, in today's times to, to some of the comments that Baiju and, and Jane have said is, is the velocity of things and speed of things that are happening, right? Can the organization address that change management to focus, like Jane said, also on those key strategic, three to five strategic initiatives that are really going to help the company grow in a sustainable manner, right? Um, and really pivot and have the change management cultural behaviors, you know, and that's a challenge in every enterprise. And, you know, Baiju, you, you, you mentioned this a little bit, right? So organizations move slower than technology and how we bring them along and how you force them. You know, one of the things that we need to think about in, in the cloud is really what's the end-to-end -end capability that you're building. And I say that because you have to enable, train and build exper expertise at the edges of the business to really be able to use cloud in a very meaningful manner that's gonna create step changes between your business and principal competitors, right? So it's really that end-to-end -end solution in holding them accountable. And, and Brett, the, the only thing I would add just to, is to put a finer point perhaps on, on a, a couple of the threads that um, Jane and Javier are saying. Um, at least in my experience, oftentimes uh, the, the way that a lot of enterprises are thinking about cl cloud is to start with cost and agility, which, which is absolutely true and it's real and it's real. Um, my, my coaching um, and my own experience is in addition to that, being clear or as clear as possible um, on, on the growth agenda and how cloud supports that on the experience agenda, how cloud, cloud supports that, and making it clear that the possibilities that cloud will unlock, and even if it's a multi-year horizon, allowing the rest of the agendas be aware and also consider their possibilities so that they're, they're not starting to contemplate the possibilities of the new experiences at year three or year five when the cloud drops. I think the, these agendas need to be more intertwined and, and really tie cloud to the core growth and experience agenda. Very compelling. Uh, and so I, I'm just going to switch gears a little bit. Um, one of the things that we talk about when we think about cloud, we, we talked earlier about its interaction with the customer experience, but clearly so much of the cloud is about all of that data, which is a few folks have mentioned, and, and all the data and advanced analytics you can do with that now. Um, and I'm going to start with Javier on this one, because um, I thought it was, I was getting to know you, just really excited to hear about some of the things that Mondelez is doing around advanced analytics and data science. Can you just talk a little bit about um, that journey in Mondelez? And, you know, I mean, I, I, I love Oreos. My family loves Oreos. But uh, the, 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 the way that um, your organization is thinking about data and analytics versus a couple of years ago versus now versus in the future, that struck me as a pretty big change for a consumer products company. And I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about the journey that you're on there. Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, a couple of years ago, we, we all thought that and believed and understood technology was in every aspect of the business. And then we started to think about data science. And today we live in algorithmic times. Whether you are have an RPA solution or any type of technology you have in the enterprise today, there's an algorithm behind it. And, you know, we're really driving our data data science capabilities in the enterprise and, and all in the spirit of, of serving our consumers in a better way. And, and with that, we were very intentional about what partners we partnered with from a cloud perspective to say, okay, our consumer and customer data is going to sit in this cloud repository because we were of the opinion that through industry sensing and other things that that's the best cloud provider that's going to help us with better insights and algorithm capabilities that they have that we could then leverage and come together with, right? So, so we, we've done that and now we're building repositories at the edges of the business like you've heard me speak about already and we are training the edges of the business in regards to how to manage data, how to have a data governance body at the they, the business needs to own the data there has to be a governance model at the edge of the business and they got they need to be accountable for what data ingresses that repository and what data egresses that repository and what data goes away i believe that data in the future is going to change that there's going to be new data sources that are going to compete with the syndicated data providers of today and and i think there'll be other data sources that we'll be using at the edges so to us it's been really end-to-end -end journey building the data science capabilities, educating the business at the edges of the business, having the right business partner from a cloud perspective, and then having the right repositories that are strategic. And then on top of that, as 
in Baju and everybody else knows there's a whole bunch of different tool sets that you need to bring into the environment for the business to drive also, which goes back to the change management dimension that we were talking about in the past, right? Because now if you change a cloud provider, you may need to change a visualization tool or a different data mining tool. So uh, there's a lot of changes, but look, we're, we're excited about the progress we're making. It's a journey, you know, and I think for every single enterprise. And um, I don't know if we're industry leading yet. That's our aspiration. And, you know, the industry tells us that when you get there. But 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 look, it's an exciting journey. And, and I think a lot of companies are being very progressive in this space. And we're certainly trying to do the same. And, and Gene, I wonder if you could add a bit on more of the B2B side. Uh, you know, I just picture, you know, the typical commercial experience from a couple of years ago where, I have a, a someone who is managing me from a relationship perspective. Uh, we have a dialogue about my needs. From time to time, I need to go source those. I fill out lots of paperwork. We have a you know a bit of a process. You fill, send paperwork back. You know it's a it, it is a very you know very wholesale process. And I just I can imagine there's so many ways that you all are reimagining that. Um, but but what role will um, data science play in that? What is it allowing you to change? Um, how is it making the shared experience we have in our heads from five years ago very different from a go forward perspective? Yeah, th thanks, Fred. It's a great question, and it's one that is discussed honestly a lot. Um, you know, I'd say in our internal world, I mean, Javier said it right. Every, everything's an algorithm at this point, and it's just a function of what data it's operating against. And so we have been very focused in our data and analytics journey on, you know, I mean, insurance is all about data. It's about consumer data. It's about risk data. It's, it's all those things, right? So for us, our data is our business. We don't make Oreos as much as I would love to be a part of a company that does have your, you and I can talk about that over a drink sometime, but um, we, our business produces a promise that will be there, you know, in a company's time of need, right, to cover a risk. So. For us, our business is all about data, and therefore, you know, our focus has been getting, you know, 36, 46, 56 sometimes years of data, believe it or not, up into the cloud um, to use. And we talk a lot about data sufficiency in the cloud as well. In other words, sometimes it doesn't have to get there in a pretty way. That's part of the iteration. Get it there, make it usable, make it accessible, and look at a lot of those tools that are available, like, you know, I mean, these days, natural language search tooling has come so far. So the ability to get away from more of the standard kind of BI tooling that we think about and really you know, use some of the new ones, it's all about just having the data available in the cloud to start with. So that's one aspect. But when you, when you think about the, um, the process and what that you know, experience of buying insurance is gonna look like, you know, the, the commercial insurance space in the small end of the world, so if you're a small business, um, it has been going the way of consumer buying experiences. I don't think that's surprising to anybody. When you get up into a bigger business, right, there tends to be more bespoke aspects. I and mean, when you get into very large commercial or depending on what business, um, what kinds of risks you write, they can become very bespoke. So what's been really fascinating in the last year and where the cloud in this and data and analytics comes in is a lot of the brokers that we work with um, are acquiring technology companies. They're acquiring software companies. They're acquiring um, innovation companies, interestingly, right? And why? Because if you think about the way that the brokers work, right, they're incentivized to find the risks that they're most likely to be able to place and to place them much faster with the company that is gonna have probably the best rate. So. Mm -hmm data and analytics and the algorithms and how they can play in and how what does that mean for a carrier and the way we have to interact back and forth with mm. those worker partners i mean that's that's really i think the next um i don't know frontier is probably overstating it but the the next real uh space that i think we're going to see some significant change in that experience very compelling and, and Beji, i wonder if you could bring this together a bit for us so if i think about um, a large organization Salespeople want to focus on sales and marketing people want to do their thing. And if I'm the new data scientist, I just want my data lake and I want to, you know, have fun and make uh, really cool analyses. And, you know, infrastructure is just one of those topics that uh, uh, people say, go figure it out. Leave me alone. That's the IT department's job uh, from time to time in an old world. The world that you all have described today, that's not the world we're living in. Um, all these things have converged. And so. I just wonder, how do you get buy-in to go through that big journey, right? How do you get 
the salesperson who just says, you know, leave me alone. My job is to go interact with customers. This is just a tax on my time. Or the marketer who says, you know, these tools, they, they're stuck between the old world and the new world. Or the data scientists who wants more uh, attention within the organization. How do you create that buy-in? How do you pull it all together to a big transformation that actually works? What are the, what are the aspects that are needed to make that happen? Yeah, it's, it's a good one, Brad. And, and part of it is cultural um, and, and part of it is strategic in, in my experience. Um, and, and if you think about strategic agendas, you're right. You could have functional agendas, as you say, sales versus marketing versus IT. Um, you could also have different layers of the enterprise stack having separate agendas. So the cloud layer has a different agenda than the intelligence layer has a different agenda than the experience layer has a different agenda than the talent layer. Um, so the, the, the way the way to to really think about this is is just tying back to the unifying compass for the enterprise, and and if you can't tell, I, I advocate for that to be the customer needs, the unmet needs for the customer, and and the key question that all the agendas, all the functions should be rallying behind is, are you clear on how you as an enterprise, how you as an enterprise fit into your customers' lives and enhance your customers' lives. And, and, and if, if all the functions and all the layers of the stack contribute appropriately to that, then, then it all comes into lockstep. And we've seen, we've seen Brad, uh, over the last year, we've done quite a bit of research on this. When those agendas are synced, it is remarkable the pace that's increased, but also those organizations actually have between a four and six X profitable growth advantage. Okay. And on, on the one hand, that sounds extraordinary. On the other hand, it should not seem that extraordinary when everything is moving in the same direction, when everything's moving in the same direction. The, the, the specific tactics that we would use, I don't know if you'd be surprised or not, but the, 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 key, the key thing when it comes to transformation and bringing everyone together is you, you have to get the organization to understand that the status quo, the status quo and the cost of status quo is greater than the risk of change. And, and that's kind of the burden uh, to cross because everyone's working in a specific way today. And, and what we're asking for is a transformation. And, and things that we would we would typically do is tactics around having everyone walk in the customer's shoes together, together, together. Working together to illustrate the unified ambition, right? Setting the North Star together, not, not functionally, but as an enterprise, but bringing all, all the organizations together. Um, continuously building and experimenting. And a lot of that is around building confidence that you can break the shackles of the functions, uh, break the shackles of history. And, and oftentimes we use partners to accelerate that journey. Um, and, and a lot of it is, is frankly, just making the proof, even the small wins very visible to the organization. I, I would say that the biggest thing that you could do, it's the easiest thing to do actually, is, is thinking about celebration. Mm -hmm. So as you scale celebrating the journey, as you, you see different behavior, that, that, that you think is, is a shining light, celebrate that. I actually think celebration uh, you know, is under assault right now because of, of the remote nature of our work and, and there's an opportunity to bring it back. But I, I often, when I look at culture, I often start with the fundamental question of what, how, and who do you celebrate? And then, and then when? And, and I actually find that to be a key ingredient, a key motivator for, for transformational change. I, and I am um, very compelling. I, and I love this notion of the cost of the status quo being greater than the risk of change. You, you hear so much about the risk and people worry about the risk and you can't make the risk go away. But when you compare it to the cost of not changing, that's a, that's a really compelling way to think about things. So I had one last question and then I was going to hand it over to the audience for questions. And so it's a, maybe a selfish question as somebody who's you know, uh, in the fight to make Chicago uh, the, the best place we can possibly make it. And, and I know that um, the three of you are very active in, in helping um, your organizations around the world, um, but particularly in, these, in, this, in, in this region. And so I just, um, I wonder, uh, and I'll start uh, Javier with you, um, if you can just talk about what it's like um, to lead an IT organization, uh, a, 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 you know, a big transformation around cloud and customer experience in Chicagoland. Uh, what what uh, what works for you, uh, and you know what are some of the things that uh, you know probably need to change in order for it to be uh, even um, more advantageous to to have your journey based here. Yes, yeah, so look at you know I've been with Mondelez now uh, 15 months, so pretty pretty uh, new to Chicago, but it's great to see the the skilled resources that we have in Chicago. It's great to see 
the academic institutions that are there. It's great to see companies like Google and Accenture having offices there and, and Facebook having offices there. I think there's a huge momentum and huge opportunity for Chicago holistically to really be considered one of those really interesting hubs where people want to go in the next generation of technology leaders and business leaders to go and, and make make Chicago home. I think there's huge opportunity in the city and it's great to see that there's a good talent repository. Now, you know, all, all of our brands being there, that means we're going to compete and we're going to borrow sometime from one another, right? Um, I've had to have conversations in my life with cloud providers. Hey, stop taking my team members. I'm trying to build your expertise in my environment. And if you just keep doing that, I'm just not going to use your cloud anymore. But it's been a little bit more of a serious discussion than that. But but look, that's going to happen anyway. And, and I think, you know, we owe it to our people to give them the opportunity to grow in their careers, right? Um, but but I think it's just going to be a, a, a really energized place to be. And, and uh, it's exciting to see the roadmap ahead for Chicago. Yeah, Javier, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's a, you know, we, we're a core institution. We've been in the loop for um, decades, right? And so Chicago is definitely home for CNA. Now we operate globally as well. Um, we've got, you know, important cities around the world, but for us in Chicago running an IT organization, I mean, it is, it is really all about kind of talent, talent development and places where the conversation unfortunately rotates to at times is, boy, it's really hard to get, you know, enough, for example, you talked a lot about data and analytics. So that data science background is huge. And because there's not a, a better pool, I think here in Chicago, there are some great talent. It gets extremely expensive and it's very hard to retain, honestly. So then you start to have conversations about, well, what other cities you know, can you get it in, et cetera. I, I worked for Liberty Mutual before I joined CNA. We had the same problem in Boston, candidly. Um, and Boston's a much smaller city. So in Chicago, I feel like with the right dialogues going on between CIOs um, and universities, et cetera, we, we can really take some of those core skills that are gonna be the future, honestly, of technology um, and or business success like data science and figure out a way to really build that skill set here and become a great hub for it with a broad spectrum of skills at different price points available for whatever we need. Yeah. And, and Brett, the, the, the only thing I would add, I mean, both Javier and Jane talked about the infrastructure, the education system, the talent. I, I also just find uh, the mindset, the mindset to be quite important. And, and I do have the, the privilege of, of working with teams across the globe. And, and obviously every team has different advantages. But when we think about going forward, the, the fog and within which we're operating, the, the premium, the premium is going to be on those teams and those individuals that are comfortable with the uncomfortable. And, and, and that requires a level of humility um, and a willingness to collaborate and to see other people's point of view. And, and that's where I think a lot of the traditional Midwest values, if you will, and maybe the contemporized, but that level of humility, willingness to, to get along, see other people's point of view, um, explore other crafts. Uh, I, I just find all of that very, very advantageous to, to this region. And it, it just comes down to the, the values and mindset and we shouldn't underplay that. How can human resources best support this digital transformation? I know that's a, that's a big question. So maybe you can just answer something that you're doing specifically at your organization to you know, quickly move this forward. So we'll start with Jane. Sure. So uh, a little bit goes back to what I just talked about, right? Like looking at the skill sets that are necessary and important and are going to be key, not just now, but what are the next skill sets as well? And thinking ahead about talent options. I think that's one aspect. The other is the future of work. I mean, we haven't talked yeah. about that here and that's a whole other webinar, right? But that yeah. I think the future of work and what it means, I mean, HR is so central to sorting out, you know, changes to policies, everything from where do you have to be physically to the hours you work to, I mean, there's just so many aspects to it. I think that'll be really important. And the last that I would say um, is around helping us think through the compensation structures that are going to be necessary to be successful and not and, and I say that not meaning money alone right if that's where we were a long time ago all the rest of what we've discussed today really plays into it that employee experience has to be as much of the core of what how we retain and uh, have talent want to stay with us quite honestly right so what do you have an example of something you're doing or something you're looking at 
for that retention piece and attraction. Sure, maybe I'll start and then Javier, maybe you can add. I mean, one of the things that we are doing is talking about how do we take the lessons that we've learned? CNA has traditionally been a company that um, believes a lot in having a everyone in the office five days a week. That's really where we were as a company, despite the fact that we're global, right? We all had global teams and we worked with people in different countries and states. Um, that is one of the things we're doing is really thinking about what's the balance in terms of in-person collaboration and taking you know, advantage of the lessons learned and the skills we've developed about our ability to work from many different potential locations. That's one example. Yeah, and, yeah. and maybe... Yeah, look, I, I think... Uh, Jane, a couple of right things, right? Employee experiences are going to be a very, very important uh, future of work. We could do a different webinar on that. You're absolutely correct. And, and I think look, the chief HR officer and the HR organization has got to be a partner at the table in regards to everything you do in regards to where in the world you're recruiting, what's the inter, in, uh, intern pool looks look like, the hiring of college grads, because, and, and I don't want to put a plug in for Accenture, but you guys do a phenomenal job. I'm very familiar with your model and Accenture is a machine in regards to Maybe Bob, you could share the numbers. I know the numbers, but we as companies need to do that. And then at the same time, one of the most critical things right now that that I'm partnering up with our chief HR officer is how we elevate what we call our digital and data intelligence acumen. I know that uh, Accenture calls it a technical quote, and I believe every company's on that journey. You know, true technology companies are way ahead of us. And then these last 14 months, technology has even gotten further ahead of us. So how do we bring the whole organization and have a sustainable, continuous model of elevating and co-elevating together? Because it's really about co-elevation of digital and data intelligence in the enterprise, right? Um, and building some very formal programs. And I, I know a lot of companies aren't comfortable using this word. It, it has to be mandated. You know, no different than as a manager, you take management training. As a financier, you take financial training. Everyone in the enterprise needs to take digital and data intelligence training or whatever you want to call it in your enterprise. And, and HR is at the center of that and partnering up with, with us. They, they have to be. Yeah. And, and Javier, just to... Brad, I hear you might be on audio. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. So glad you're back. I'm way outside my comfort zone here. <laughs> That's right. So, so Javier, one, great, one, one, great interesting, yeah, one interesting point... Um, that, that I just wanted to piggyback off of uh, was th this idea of cross-training and making sure that the teams are conversant. And, and you, you mentioned Accenture. We certainly have um, required, no, no matter what your core discipline is, uh, learning about technology, learning about cloud. And then the next tranche is making sure folks are, are conversant in design, as an example, no matter what your, your core is. And, and we used to talk about kind of, kind of T-shaped expertise, which is you're very deep in something, but you you're conversant in all. And, and now the, the new mental model is kind of star-shaped, which is, it's not even in the core discipline. You, you need to be able to stretch in different ways in different industries. And that's where the, the real opportunities are. Um, and and it, it, it is, there are many tactics that HR can help facilitate, whether it's cross-training, whether it's apprenticeship programs, whether it's tours of duty in other departments or other firms. There, there's a lot of clever things that I think uh, you, you, could, you could apply now. And uh, I also have the benefit of, of teaching a class at uh, Northwestern and one of the key things that the, the students are, are, are very uh, keen on is looking for employers where they can explore, where they can explore and they're not gonna, they're not gonna get locked in. And, and the entire thesis is hybrid innovators and hybrid leaders are what's gonna be at a premium. So when you think about career trajectories, anything that, that feels like you're locked into a function or locked into a job is less attractive to them. And, and I just think that is the, the future of work as well, which is allowing and facilitating that exploration. I think that's absolutely correct. I think it's funny you bring up the T models because you went from T models to M models, and now the star model is very, very relevant, right? So absolutely. But you need to enable that by doing the enterprise also, right? Because if not, you're not going to have a very excited workforce that comes to work every day that knows your dynamic enterprise in regards to platforms and tools and, and things that they'll work with and learn from every day. Sure. I had a follow-up question just so if you think about um, another important people issue and, and a corporate and company in, uh, role in the world issue, um, right? It's the 100-year anniversary of uh, what happened in Tulsa. And I was struck yesterday to read about one of our uh, beloved Chicagoans, John Rogers, uh, whose grandfather owned a business in Tulsa that if it had, had not been destroyed today, if it had equity market returns, would be worth $100 million dollars. 
uh, instead it was burned to the ground, right? Um, or you think about we're, we're coming, or we, we were, you know, the, the anniversary of the George Floyd um, of the challenge and, and everything that that's meant. Um, you know, IT and, and technology is one of those areas that uh, creates so much opportunities for folks. Um, and and uh, but I think it's also a field that uh, has not always been on the front edge of uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, but it creates a lot of opportunity now. Um, to, to ensure the next generation gets to participate. Can you just talk a little bit about um, uh, what you see as the key issues to, to enable much more equity in the work that we talked about today uh, and, and maybe what we all can do um, to, to ensure that we uh, succeed there? And maybe Jane, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure. Yeah, it's a topic I'm actually very passionate about, have been um, for many years. And I think in the last 12 months, the dialogue shift has been shifting in a way that I really appreciate. It's more real than where we've been in a corporate dialogue about it. Um, it's more raw, which is awkward and uncomfortable, but necessary to really shift it. So those two things I've been very happy about. I think when you think about the um, what's needed, I mean, there, there's so many different things. One, we, we have to have leaders that actually believe that diversity of thought and background and experience matters bottom line. Because without that, that ability to really appreciate, I mean, I, I always say it's fun to work in a team of people that are just like you, because it's easy, right? We think the same, we talk the same, I make a joke, you laugh, it's great. Versus, you know, if, if I'm different than the neighbor that sits next to me, I make a joke, they look at me oddly, the whole thing's uncomfortable, I'm only going to interact with them when I need to. So some of it's about leaders really creating the environment for that diversity. And the second is investing in it putting time and money where your mouth is. There's a great organization here in Chicago called Genesis Works. Mm -hmm. I don't know if others have worked with them before. Um, we've had a couple of interns. Basically what they do is they take interns from communities, and these are high school students from communities here in Chicago who perhaps are not in an environment where they have a lot of great role models for um, continuing in higher education. So they may or may not you know, have a vision for what that could look like and what they can do. And companies can provide, and it's so inexpensive, you know, opportunities for interns to come in and to experience what it's like working in a couple fields. And we've done that this last 12 months, and it's been really a tremendous experience, both for my staff, um, as well, I, I hope, as the interns that we have. Compelling. Javier, Bejo, anything to add? Looks like Javier, you may be on mute. Sorry, I, sorry, thank you. I said I'll just be brief because I know we're down to a couple of minutes. I'll give Baji some time also. But everything that, that Jane says resonates for us in our enterprise. You know, we're big believers. Bring yourself to work in whatever that means. And we also believe always have, having diversity at the table. We know that when you have women in boards and in companies, companies perform better. When you have diversity of thought and diversity of belief, and, and I think we just got to call it the way it is. You know, we have our personal and professional unconscious biases that we need to break through, right? Because, you know, we like that person that's like us, right, Jane, that you could tell that joke to and they're going to laugh and versus the other person that's going to look funny. But I think we're learning as as we continue to, to, to embrace this big change that's necessary that, you know, other things are funny too and other people have different perspectives and all that's great. But, uh, uh, and I think it's just really, really exciting, right? But uh, we really focus on that quite a bit at Mondelez as well. And Brad, just quickly, um, one of the, I agree with everything that Jane and Javier are saying, just one very specific thing that we're doing that I want to call out that I'm, I'm actually quite excited by is we have rolled out a, what's called a 360 degree value framework, kind of redefining how to think about value creation and it's actual measurement framework that's being rolled out across all the work we do. Um, and, and the entire idea is hold our teams accountable for helping our clients look across all the vectors, not just financial growth, but talent growth, sustainability, and diversity inclusion. And, and thinking about that as a, as a system and making sure that we feel some joint responsibility with our clients and pushing on all of those vectors at the same time. So they're, all, they're all interrelated as it turns out. Um, and so I, I really am pretty bullish on this idea of 360 degree value as opposed to the primary lever today, which is like financial growth. Well, I want to thank our amazing panelists for your perspective. Uh, you add a lot of value. You got me excited about what lies ahead. Uh, Accenture, um, so grateful for your sponsorship into the Executives Club. Thank you for continuing to bring Chicago together. I don't know what we've done without you uh, the past 12 months. We've been able to continue the conversation. So thank you to everyone. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of this incredibly sunny and beautiful day in Chicago. 
and look forward to talking to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.